So a very warm welcome to our audience of GOTGM 2022. Today we are honoured to have with us uh, Prof. Dr. Sanjay Rampa, who will be speaking on a very interesting topic called diet and nutrition. So Prof. Sanjay, thank you for, for being here today. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to talk to, to you all on, on various topics. All right. Thanks, Prof. Sanjay. So, uh, before we dive straight into the topic of discussion, I think it's only fair that the audience uh, knew you a little bit better. So, allow me to have a proper introduction uh, of Prof. Sanjay. So, uh, Prof. Sanjay is a public health medicine specialist and a professor of epidemiology here at the Department of Social and Preventive Medicine, Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya. Uh, he was medically trained in India and served in the Ministry of Health of Malaysia uh, from 98 to 2005. Uh, following uh, then, he moved to University of Malaya from 2005 onwards. He obtained his Master's of Public Health in 2004 from uh, the prestigious Harvard University and then also completed his, uh, his PhD in Epidemiology from Johns Hopkins University in 2014. Uh, his research focuses on the, both the epidemiology as well as the prevention of cardiovascular disease and he hopes to leverage uh, the information uh, that he's producing to design and implement better prevention programs to improve our healthcare system. Uh, during the time of the pandemic, uh, Dr. Rampal also shifted his research more on the epidemiology and prevention of COVID-19. And uh, in addition to that, he aims to provide a better interpretation of COVID-19 evidence base for the public and policy makers. And he actively communicates the public through the media on current issues pertaining to COVID-19. So once again, we are honoured to have you here, Prof. Sanjay. Thank you. Thank you, Joel, for the very lengthy introduction. All right. So I guess we can we can move on to today's uh, topic, which is diet and nutrition. Uh, and we will start off with our first section, which is called Nutrient Density uh, as a Basis for Healthier Food Options. So, Prof. Sanjay, uh, what exactly uh, do you define as nutrient density? So, basically, what we, we are trying to do is we're trying to move to a metric of measuring what are healthier foods and differentiating healthier foods from unhealthy foods, right? So, you may have heard of various uh, methods used in the past of dictating what is healthy and what is not. So nutrient density is a more recent concept uh, that we use to help us uh, measure uh, or categorize foods as either being healthy or not. Typically, it's, it's the basis for nutrient density calculation. Uh, there are various nutrient density calculations that you can do, uh, but they all involve uh, the total amount of nutrients you consume divided by the amount of uh, calories you take, for example, mm. right? So w w then the idea is to apportion, right, that in a food uh, that, that weighs so much, how, many, how much nutrients are there as a proportion of that amount. So I think that's why it's important. And typically, uh, so the, as I said, there are many metrics. So sometimes we use calories per, per 100 grams of food. Uh, sometimes we use micronutrients or macronutrients such as protein. So if you're interested in the effect of a high protein diet, for example, you could look at the amount of proteins you consume in a certain amount of food measured as uh, weight. That means grams or kilograms, not kilograms, but grams are typically. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Prof. Sanjay. So uh, would you say uh, nutrient density is, is how we can use to define healthy food? and and is healthy food only based on nutrient density or are there other factors that come into play when we define what is healthy food? I, th I think that's a very important question, right? So I think nutrient density is just a metric we can use. We can use, uh, we can use it to actually, uh, we can also assess diets, remember. Remember that when we talk about nutrition, that there are many levels of nutrition that we can, we, we can discuss. Because typically a person eats a food, a food group, right? A type of food. And a collection of food that a person consumes becomes a diet, right? So you have food, uh, food items that you eat regularly. Then you have a, co a combination of foods prepared in a certain way that becomes a diet pattern. And 
in addition to food items and diet patterns, we can also go down uh, really deep and look at nutrient levels, right? A certain nutrient compared with other nutrients. So you, if you remember, you might not remember. <laughs> so you, you all are younger, a bit younger, but if, if you go back to the 90s, right? Early 90s, uh, they used to say cholesterol was bad, right? And it was because cholesterol is a nutrient, right? And what, what happened is, in addition to cholesterol, they were talking about saturated fatty acids. So sat, saturated fatty acids is, not, is another... Fatty acid, uh, fats is a macronutrient, and saturated fatty acid is a subtype of fat in our diet, in, in our diet. So what the, the recommendations that came out then early on was that saturated fatty acid, uh, saturated fat was bad, and cholesterol was bad, right? So then, then they said, okay, reduce the amount of butter in your diet. This was uh, really early in the 90s uh, or late 80s. And what happened is people stopped eating butter, but they replaced butter with margarine, right? Margarine, which was high in trans fat, right? And so at, at that point of time, uh, a couple of years later, they analyzed the data and they said, wait a minute. They even did a very big randomized controlled trial replacing fat intake with carbohydrate intake. And what they found from, from the large uh, trial was contradictory to, to their predisposing assumptions. What they found was that uh, this the, the group that was randomized to carbohydrates were actually doing poorer than the group uh, that, that was having their normal diets, right? So then they said, wait a minute, maybe we're measuring the wrong item here, right? So it's not a matter of, of fat, it's not a matter of carbohydrate, but it's the type of carbohydrates that you eat. Then they found out that the group that reduced their fat intake actually replaced their flat fat intake with simple processed carbohydrates. And I think that that, that was a very big uh, discovery and it moved towards the concept of it was not a matter of macronutrient as carbohydrate or fat, but it's the type of carbohydrate you consume and the type of fat you consume. Now, moving on to the carbohydrate uh, uh, analogy is that when, when, when they look at carbohydrates, and carbohydrates is a very interesting uh, macronutrient, is that all carbohydrates are not made the same. And so that's why this movement now of a, a low carb diet also has its own limitations, right? It's, it's not that all carbohydrates are bad, but I think what they found was that simple processed carbohydrates had, more, had, a, had a, detrim, a more detrimental effect on your health compared with complex carbohydrates, right? Just because of the way it is metabolized and the way glucose is derived from those food items. Now, coming back to nutrient density. So, so that, that, that is where I'm coming from. I'm coming from a point where initially we were talking about categorizing food based on nutrients themselves, right? Then saying, wait a minute, not all food items are the same, right? And if you, if you think back of the pyramid, right? Uh, most of you would have been exposed to some sort of food pyramid. The, the prevailing pyramid of the 90s and maybe even the 2000s was the pyramid which showed uh, fat at the, at the top, that means least amount of fat, and carbohydrate was the bottom part, right? And that food pyramid actually, uh, in the mid-2000s itself, got uh, a lot of people started criticizing the food pyramid, right? Uh, it was interesting that the, the original food pyramid was actually uh, sponsored by the Department of Agriculture, who, which were also had a... Uh, so the question of independence came up because Department of Agriculture, the, the US Department of Agriculture actually had a, a large say in the wheat production of the world, right? And and this moved on. So, so the food pyramid itself became problematic, right? So food pyramid, micronutrients became a problem. Then we went into diet patterns, right? Then we went into the issue that maybe it's not the nutrients, it's how you prepare your food which is important. So when you do nutrient analysis, you, you actually miss out on number one, how the food is prepared, right? And number two, the combination of food items, right? So uh, the diet 
anal, anal, diet analysis and the analysis of diet and cardiovascular disease and NCDs moved on to diet patterns. The idea being that uh, people consume certain patterns, right? You, I'm sure you have heard of the Mediterranean pattern. Uh, the traditional diet pattern has also, the, the term traditional diet pattern has also gained traction in the past. And of course, the Western diet pattern, which for some reason is equated to no, no, and it's very bad, right? Uh, but the idea is, if you think of the diet west, uh, west, the Western pattern is you're thinking of pizzas and French fries, for example. The traditional diet pattern you're thinking about, uh, you're thinking about fruits and vegetables. What what your ancestors would be eating, right? <laughs> not, in, not not even your ancestors actually. Now would be what your grandparents would have eaten, or maybe your parents in their really young days, right? And then the 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 concept of diet patterns. It still prevails, still a very good concept, right? But in addition to diet patterns, this point of nutrient density came up, right? In that it's simple actually, if you think about it, when we talk about simple processed food or carbohydrates, right? From carbohydrates, you went to food items. So any food item which is highly processed typically has a detrimental effect on your health, right? So the less processed is it, the better. Now, can there be another me metric, right, on measuring this? So if you think of a processed food, typically what they do is they're high calories, right, but they're, they're very low in nutrients. So they're nutrients fast food. So that's why this idea of nutrient density came up, in that healthy food items are actually food items which have a lot of nutrients, but not so much calories, right? Now what... Think about the food items that, that, that you may equate to having high nutrient density. So my favorite example would be maybe broccoli, right? Because it's, or you can think of cauliflower, it's big, right? It's chunky, it's fibrous, high nutrients, low in calorie, right? You can also think of other cruciferous vegetables. So the vegetables themselves are a very big group of food items. You think of cruciferous food items in, in local cells, think of kangkong, payam, right, uh, spinach. Uh, then you can think of various uh, kailan, various green leafy vegetables, right? So if you actually consume this green life, a lot of these green leafy vegetables, you'll find that they're actually very high in nutrients, very low in calories, right? So that, that's where we move on. Uh, we, we have moved on, I would say, in our metrics of classifying food items. And nutrient density is one of those metrics that you can use to help you differentiate between your food options that you have. All right, thank you so much for that, uh, Prof Sanjay. I think it was very insightful. So I guess you can say there are a lot of factors to take into account when we want to call something healthy so there's the nutrient density then how processed it is and then your diet pattern is also important because different people have different diet patterns it's so, a combination. Line... So, so with regards to diet sorry sorry it's a bit, uh, but the idea of diet patterns is it sometimes is the combination of food have synergistic effects which mm. is more than the original food item ah i see that, that's pretty interesting also and i guess a topic uh, for another day as well so uh, in line with all this uh Malaysians especially, I think we are blessed with uh, bountiful amounts of, of food. So practically, what would you advise someone? So in terms of, uh, for example, one uh, wants to actually take a healthy diet. So when you have all of these factors into account, so practice, what, what would be your practical advice, advice then, Prof? So my practical advice is number, choose a diet high in fruits and vegetables. Hmm. Remember that uh, for 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 vegetables, I'm talking about cruciferous foods. Make sure that your the, the vegetables that you consume vary in color and type. So there is a role for, for the orange kind of foods for your beta carotene intake, like uh, carrots, pumpkin, gourd, so on and so forth. But at the same time, there's a role for cruciferous vegetables. And, and there's also uh, the, the other types of uh, less frequent uh, vegetables that you may have. So key key thing is our diet high in vegetable intake fruit intake remember that all fruits are not the same 
there's some fruits which are very high in sugar, right? And some fruits which are lower in sugar. So if I was to make a distinction, citrus fruits, I think are good, right? Apples should be taken in moderation because apples do have a lot of sugar. Something like watermelon, uh, you, you can think of any of our tropical fruits which are overripe, should be taken sparingly. Now, coming to fruits, one common uh, misrepresentation in the market has been that fruits equates to fruit juice, right? So, last time, if you, if you remember the uh, schools, we used to say Coca-Cola was bad, carbonated drinks was bad, fruits is good. So, what did Coca-Cola do? Coca-Cola caters to its customers, so they produce orange fruit juice, which kids went and drank in, in, in the bottles. But the problem is, each bottle of orange juice was, was the equivalent of, a, was it four to eight oranges? Now think of it this way, can you eat four to eight oranges in a gulp in about a few minutes? It's going to be very difficult. So remember that when we talk about fruits and vegetables, we're, we're not talking about processed juices, we're talking about the crude fruit, that means the unprocessed fruit. Uh, there is this trend for blending, for juicing, right? The main, the, my, my main comment with juicing is, if you find blending helps you consume fruits and vegetables, go ahead, but do not separate the fiber from the juice, right? Um, though traditionally, they, uh, not, not traditionally, but uh, they found it scientifically that it's always better to eat food and fruits rather than to drink them. But if you feel that you have to juice them or blend them, uh, remember to consume the whole fruit. So for example, take a blender, put the whole apple in, blend it all you want and consume that rather than putting it that there are certain juices which extract the juice from the fiber i think that's that that is not useful thanks uh prof Sanjay. i think that was some sound advice uh so moving on on the, the topic of healthy food there's also this thing called uh, organic food uh, as, as an alternative so uh, what what would you say defines uh, what is called organic food and would that be uh, under the, the whole umbrella of healthy food as well. I would say organic, the term organic refers to the way a food was planted, right? A food item was prepared. Prepared here means how it was planted, whether pesticides was used, what, where was it, uh, where was the agriculture, what, what was the agricultural practices used in producing that food? Um, initially, we, there, there, there was this thought that if you use less pesticides, right, if you grew it in a, in, in a certain way, that the nutrients of that food item would be better. But there are certain problems, right? So just because an item is organic does not mean it has low pesticide. What we have is we have the problem with persistent pesticides in our land. So, for example, uh, just to give you an example in Maryland, uh, I, I, I use this example quite often, where they had organic farms producing baby food, right? But when, when they actually did the analysis, they, they found pesticides in the food. So the problem is that the pesticides had already gone into the land and it was in the land. So that said i think rather than organic I, I think what we will be moving towards is sustainable farming i think sustainable farming is important for a different reason for the climate for the planet uh, but but with regards to our health i think it still boils down to the food we eat right so eating food high in fruits and vegetables is much preferred than and then than a, a a food a diet filled with red meat, for example. I've not touched on meat consumption. So ideally, you would want to reduce your meat consumption. But if you consume meat, uh, the, what the literature has shown is, number one, processed meat is worse than unprocessed meat. So number one. Number two, white meat is supposed to be better than red meat, right? So, so that, that's, that's my coverage on, on meat consumption per se and organic food. Right, thanks Prof Sanjay. Um, so moving on to uh, vitamins, uh, as, as we look at in bottles and supplements, 
So, uh, what are some of the pros and cons of taking these types of uh, supplements? And as much as they are convenient, uh, do you think that the convenience they provide uh, outweighs the potential uh, drawbacks? Thank you. Thank you for the question. So, first, first, what I'll do is uh, l- uh, let me talk about multivitamins, right? Because I think vitamins are big. Um, interestingly, a number of systematic reviews and meta-analysis on multivitamins have found that there is no beneficial effect of multivitamins. Number one, number two, there may be a small uh, increase in risk of mortality among those consuming multivites. But that's a small risk, about 5 five to 10%. So what I would say is there's no evidence of a beneficial effect of multivitamins. However, there is a caveat, right? The caveat is you're not deficient in any vitamins. So the point about vitamins is you should, you should not be deficient in them. But once if, if your vitamin levels are good enough, right? You're not deficient in them. Consuming extra vitamins does not have any additional benefit. That's multivitamins. With regards to supplements, so the issue with supplements is again going back to my initial uh, point on nutrients. If I was to give you a supplement in a pill, right? I wouldn't be giving you a tomato, a broccoli or a mixture of vegetables in a pill. What I want to know is what is that magic chemical compound that I can give you that will improve your health. And so then you have all kinds of supplements. You go to a pharmacy, you get A to Z. There was even a vitamin called A to Z, by the way. It, it was it was a very famous uh, I think by Centrum Centrum was one and there were there were a lot of generics also A to Z vitamin, but coming back to supplements so the issue with supplements is from from, from the reviews that I have uh, done the only supplement which may be beneficial so number one I I'm saying almost all supplements that that there's no evidence of. Uh, great benefit from randomized control trials so typically you get evidence coming up from observational studies which show that so and so nutrient is beneficial but when we go to randomized control trials the, the benefit disappears so the only thing that has persisted may be fish oil and the fish oil comes from the long chain PUFAS polyunsaturated fatty acid uh, omega-3 omega-6 but uh, so far those uh, and even when we talk about uh, PUFAS, you, you have uh, the plant base and you have fish base. So the only thing that we have uh, that I've seen uh, for, for meta-analysis that has been beneficial is fish oil. However, there, there is an issue with fish oil that the benefit comes from uh, deep fish, right? Because uh, the way that the benefit accrues is from the bigger fishes eating the smaller fishes who initially add the seaweed or the algae, mm-hmm. right? But the problem with this concentrating mechanism is it also concentrates other chemicals such as persistent heavy heavy compa- uh, heavy uh, heavy chemicals such as mercury, right? So th- that that's where I say that there is uh, that that I've seen uh, no I've seen. Uh, that there has been RCTs on this showing a benefit, uh, but the evidence is still not uh, not causal. I wouldn't say it's causal yet. All other supplements right. so far have failed the randomized con- the large randomized control trial test. Mm. All right. Thanks, Prof. I think that that's a very interesting uh, result from from the RCTs yeah, and and quite shocking also based on you know on no. what we've been. Yeah. Remember that. The, the, the commercial interest in the supplements are so strong. They mm. basically market anything and everything, right? So the, the, the moment an observational study finds, oh, so-and-so is, is useful, soon after you'll have a marketing arm and, and people start selling it. I would say the latest fad is actually vitamin D, even though some would, may disagree, but I call it a fad because it is still not yet established. So mm-hmm. before vitamin D, we had stuff like homocysteine. I'm, I'm not sure whether you remember, uh, but there, there was a lot about homocysteine. And vitamin C, vitamin C was from the 80s. We used to give vitamin C to everybody. And there was a trial done, ATBC trial, 
which had aimed to, to show definite proof that vitamin C was useful. And they found the opposite to be true, that uh, those with vitamin C, if I'm not mistaken, had a higher risk of lung cancer. Mm. And soon after that, vitamin C got... And there were other trials with vitamin C and let's say URTI. And, and when, when the results of these RCTs come out, then the evidence diminishes. And if in, it's very interesting if you monitor the supplements market, the, the demand, there, there is some evidence, observation evidence, then the demand increases to a point where we say, wait a minute, a lot of people are taking this. Let's do a large randomized control trial. And then guess what? The evidence is not as you think it was, or there's no evidence. And then basically it, uh, it decreases. The, mm. the sales decrease. All right. Thanks, Rob. That was very, very interesting and nice to hear as well. So uh, I guess now we can move on or transition into the second part of our podcast uh, where we talk about diet transition and obesity. So perhaps, Prof, you can you can define to us what exactly is diet transition and obesity. So let me put it this way. I'm talking about Malaysia right now, right? In Malaysia, we have had a transition in our population over the many years, right? If you think of the 70s, 70% were living in rural Malaysia. Approximately 30% was living in, in urban Malaysia. The, the cultures and practices that time in the 70s was one which was more agrarian. There's a lot of agriculture going on in the country. People were more physically active, right? And the kinds of food we eat also was different, very localized, right? So if you think of the 70s, if I was in, let's say, uh, if I was, let's say in Kelantan, I'll be eating food which is, a, which is grown and available within, let's say, Kelantan or the surrounding area, right? I won't be consuming apples from New Zealand and pears from South Africa, right? So what has happened is over a period of time from the 70s to now, let's say 50 years, uh, the population has changed. We have moved to the cities, right? We have become richer. Our world has changed. We live in a much more connected world. So my, my point just now that if you were staying in a rural area last time, or even if you're staying in KL for that matter, you were not going to get peaches from South Africa or apricots from Chile, right? You were just going to get whatever was grown in our backyards uh, outside KL, or worse come to worse from Cameron Highlands or from, from surrounding areas. But the, the issue now is that availability food Availability has changed on a global scale. Interestingly, the producers, if you talk about the large producers of the large companies that control food production, has actually reduced. There are very few countries, uh, sorry, not countries, there are very few multinational companies controlling the availability of food. There is this illusion of choice at the moment. You think you have choice, right? And you think you are free to think, you're free to buy whatever you want. But the problem is, when you go down to, let's say, your, your Aeon, for example, right? When, or Jaya Grocer, you are only limited to the choice you have in that place. And that food items were actually already chosen. And the interesting thing is, I'm, I'm not sure whether you all do, I do this because of, I don't know what uh, my interest in the area, but usually when I go around, I look at what food is available and sometimes I just read the labels, right? Just to see which is healthy and which is not. But the interesting thing is the food items available in Jaya Grocer and Village Grocer will be different from that available from, let's say, Aeon, right? Uh, available from Pasamalam. Uh, I'm not sure many go, still goes to Pasamalam or the morning markets or night markets, but the kinds of food available to you in all these places are very different. So what that has done, what that, what that has done is, over a period of time, 50 years ago, we were eating locally produced foods which were seasonal. Some foods were in season sometimes and not in other times. We were less likely to eat processed food because we were all eating locally produced food which was not kept for long, right? Coming now, where food can be kept for years, right? The apple that you add was not, was not harvested yesterday. It was harvested many months ago. 
So there's a level of processing that occurs to all our food items. And because the availability of food has changed, our diets have changed. And this is what I'm this is what I summarize as diet transition. Our diets have moved on from the healthy traditional diets to a combination right now of what is available, which is a mix of healthy, uh, traditional, Western, and also what is fast and easy. So if you think about um, I don't want to I don't want to I don't want to only mention mamak food, but it's just that we all call it mamak food. Uh, rather than mamak food, I would call it fast and freely available food, right? This kind of diets are very different, very different from what was uh, what our parents or grandparents were eating many many years ago. That so that is diet transition. All right, thanks a lot, Prof Sanjay. So uh, moving on to obesity now. So you mentioned that with the diet transition, what we've been eating 50 years ago and now has completely changed. So uh, perhaps how, how do you define obesity? And, and since you have extensive uh, experience in epidemiology, what is the current prevalence of obesity uh, among Malaysians? So the, the, the two things, how would I define obesity, right? So I would say number one, uh, obesity just states is defined as uh, increase in adiposity. That's a simple definition, right? Adiposity levels higher than normal, right? But uh, that that's that's the most general definition. But if you prefer a better marker or more specific definition, is we typically use BMI, body mass index. I would say that BMI is a marker of general adiposity. We also have differentiated adiposity between general adiposity and let's say central adiposity. So central, obi- sorry, central obesity. So central obesity, we would use the waist circumference, right? And use a cutoff or, uh, of, of the waist circumference in order to, to, to classify uh, a person as centrally obese or not centrally obese. Uh, with, with regards to its prevalence, uh, that puts me in a spot, but I would say that it was about what, 20%. Uh, but I'm not private. But what I know is obesity plus overweight forms, like, I don't know, was it 50%, 40%, 40% or 50% of population. Uh, the issue with obesity is, I think the big issue with obesity is this. There, there had been a drastic change in the prevalence of obesity over the over this past 10, 20 years that has been very rapid. So there's been a rapid increase in the prevalence of obesity in the past 20 years. Because if you look at the prevalence of obesity in 90s, we had an NHMS in 96, right? And the prevalence of obesity was about, I don't know, 5%, right? And I was involved with a study in 2004, right? And we estimated the obesity as 13%. I remember that time, I, 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 I reviewed the results. I spoke with an external consultant, uh, someone from Utrecht. And I was telling him, oh, we, we found such a large increase. And he actually did not believe it. <laughs> he said, most likely you're measuring different things. There must be some measurement error. So that's 2004. 2006 comes along and we were up uh, to about 15%. Um, so there was a very large rise, but I think over the past uh, five years or five to ten years, it has kind of, the, the trajectory, the, the rate of increase has decreased. So it goes up it's exponentially. Now we're, we're coming to the point where it's plateauing. This, interestingly, this the same kind of trajectory was seen in the US, uh, but the US preceded us, I think, by 10 years. Um, so that is where uh, I believe in transitions. What we had before was, if you talk about the, the 80, 90s, right? 80 and 90s, we had social economic transition. Suddenly people went to the cities. Suddenly we had more money. But this more money came at a cost. It came at a cost of our living environment and where we live and how we live. And this effect, it takes some time for the effect to settle in. So it took about, I don't know, about 10 years for it to show up. So you're talking about a rise in obesity in, let's say, 2005. I would say that there will be a, 
that, that that's what we, we we will also be experiencing we are experiencing is a rapid rise in diabetes so you can think of changes in upstream markers like bmi uh, upstream marker to me is not even bmi is food our diet changed because our diet changed we became more obese or the higher proportion of our population is uh, has uh, more weight or overweight or obese and we don't get it immediately but when this population of overweight and obese lives longer then the prevalence of diabetes shoots up and it doesn't stop there because after the prevalence of diabetes shooting up in another 10 years to 15 years our rate of uh, renal failure will shoot up psrf and stage renal failure and that is something i think when we talk about an epidemic of obesity we don't feel it so much right um because people are people people are still moving around then then you see an epidemic of diabetes then you say wait a minute cost of healthcare will go up right then you then the moment we see an epidemic of renal failure i think it's too late at least then that that is way too late down now the problem is this the problem is those who hold the purses will not react to the change of obesity so you, you go you go to you go to those funders right you go to the government and you said you tell the government people are getting fat right let's say so what economy still runs everything still runs uh private companies still are running and there, there, there's no no problem to the economy right so when diabetes when, when healthcare expenditure goes up then only people start to take a, a greater uh interest in what's happening but that that may be too late because remember that complications of diabetes is it's just a matter of time even though you have better control of it but the complications will go up all right thank you so much uh prof sanjay i think that, that was very uh, interesting so uh, you mentioned earlier on how like uh, we saw an increase in the rate of obesity exponentially and then it sort of led to down so just uh, one I just wanted to explore more on, on what what are some of the reasons you think uh, it has plateaued, and perhaps how can we build on that to you know further plateau or maybe reduce the the recurrence of uh, obesity. So there are many lines of thought behind why it's plateauing, right? Uh, one line of thought says that this is just an aberrant, this is just noise, that it's going up. The signal says it's going up. Then you have some noise. After some time, it goes up again. I I actually gave it real thought and and to me it's a matter of susceptibility right so just like infectious disease you start with a susceptible person you start with a susceptible population so my point about obesity is this the whole population the susceptibility of each of us to obesity is different mm. we have some amount of resilience built into us with our lifestyle practices where we live how we live you you um uh, actually i have a very nice system map on this but my point is when we talk about obesity okay uh, let me bring it down right obesity is map is just an imbalance of energy intake think about it this way right imbalance of energy intake there are more energy going to your body than getting expended so that's simple food that you eat versus exercise It seems easy, right? Do more exercise, eat less food. Problem solved. But wait a minute, we also have this thing called physio internal physiology going on, uh, our basal metabolic rate so on and so forth. All right. But then what affects your food? That's where system come into play. Food availability, food generation, and there are many systems and policies in play that makes you actually eat a certain kind of food more and less of the other at the same time where you live right uh may influence your physical activity mm. now coming back to to the point it what was the point again i got lost i got lost in the system map <laughs> all right uh, no worries so yeah i so, just wanted to explore on, on how uh, oh yeah susceptibility uh-huh, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay Uh so with regards to susceptibility I think our population have various types of people some are more susceptible to obesity some are more resilient mm. so what has happened in the past decade or so is the the subgroup right in our population 
who are most susceptible to obesity have been affected. Mm. That's where you have subgroups of people for whatever reason. And these reasons are not simple as I said because the reasons are a mixture of, of a lot of factors but those who are more susceptible to obesity have been affected and they became they become obese first. Now, if our environment, if our changes in the transitions that we are going on do not change, if we do not change for a better, we continue to be more urbanized, we continue to eat more processed food, we continue to be more sedentary, what happens is a different subgroup which is less susceptible will then become obese. Mm. So over a period of time, if we don't change our environment, uh, when, when I mean environment, I'm talking about micro-macro, right? If we don't change the way we live, right? Then eventually a large proportion of the population will become obese. Mm. Now, what, what, an important point about the environment, it's not just temperature, <laughs> It's just not uh, the, the environment you see. I'm talking about the built environment. I think built environment is, is one aspect in an urban setting which is very, very important. Right? What we have is we have capital, uh, capitalistic approach towards our economy. We have huge number of companies building houses developing land without actually investing enough in producing a healthier environment mm. right if you look at KL every corner a, a, a developer takes up a chunk of land and they maxim, they use it to the maximum so there is a code on how many percent should be green lung or green land and they will find a way to minimize that <laughs> right so the problem then is the the the, the populations, uh, our people who stay in those areas, find it very difficult to to expand energy to, to do any activity. Close to our heart, close to UM, I would say, look at Lamba Pantai, best example. Uh, if you have not gone to Lamba Pantai, go go to go to Lamba Pantai and walk around the PPR. Right, uh, you can try walking from the university, and the, the the so-called university LRT, walk right down and take a left, and then think if you're living in one of those flats, right, and if you're living there, you go to your doctor and your doctor says, why you never exercise? Do more exercise, and figure out how are you going to do that. So the problem with us is we have built communities, but we have not built healthy communities. There was a there, there's actually a very interesting proposal by Sing, uh, past proposal in, in the past year or so by Singapore. The idea is to bring build vertical villages. So we always mm. villages to be horizontal, but since we, we have a lot more high rise buildings, we should be looking at building vertical villages, whereby then we, we should figure out a way whereby the occupants can gain their physical activity within the confine of their vertical village. It may not improve social connectedness between these, these high-rise uh, developments, but it at least provides an opportunity to the, to the occupants of these high-rise buildings to go out and do some physical activity. One more point about physical activity is that physical activity need not be exercise we have this concept of non-exercise physical activity, NEPA, right? And, and I experienced this in the US, right, when I was doing my PhD, because I used to take public transport every day. I used to spend about an hour in the morning, uh, one bus, two trains, and walking in between, right? And just by going to, to the school, or to, to, to school, uh, I was getting my fair, my daily share of physical activity. I didn't need to do anything else actually. Mm. By just walking uh, out, by walking to public transportation, taking public transportation and coming out and walking in, you get sufficient. And this can be extrapolated to even UM, right? So in Malaysia, our last mile connectivity is very bad, right? Uh, so like if UM, if, if you can think that if someone comes in Jalan University, 
right? Currently, you still can walk. I, I have colleagues of mine, like Prof Hazrin, who walks almost every other day who uses public transport, right? Mm. But if you could make it easier for more of us, right? So that I don't have to live next to the LRT station. If we all started taking more public transportation, that would increase our active transportation. And that in itself will reduce the prevalence of obesity because all of us will be doing more physical activity. Mm. Yep. All right. Yeah. Thanks. That's very clear, Prof. Sanjay. Yeah, I think you, you gave us a lot of insight. And, and not only on, on obesity, but how we can battle this, this problem. So uh, moving on to the, the last section of our podcast for today. So earlier you mentioned on the upstream markers, like not even BMI, but food. You know, which which if you see a rise, then you see a, a subsequent rise in obesity, diabetes, and end stage renal failure. So, uh, just just want to uh, in the line of food uh, food intake and all that. So, I just want to talk a bit on the salt intake uh, as the population and the subsequent rise in blood pressure and all that. So, what is your opinion on how much salt we are cons- consuming as a population? So, um, it's not my opinion, but it has been. It's, the evidence is out there. Mm-hmm. I, exact numbers, I'm not sure, but I think sodium-wise, we are consuming more than 5 grams of sodium. And we are consuming more than 8 grams of salt, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, we are consuming too much. <laughs> In summary, our population of intake of salt is a lot. Uh, but that is not in isolation. Globally, we are consuming more salt than we should. Uh, the reasons for this, uh, there are various reasons for this. Uh, number one, it's it's industry. So number one, our industry, the processed food that we get have high sodium. Number two, the sodium that's uh, the food that's prepared, uh, the fast and uh, fast and easy food, so to say, right? The mama, the stalls, so on and so forth. The food you get outside is actually loaded with sodium, right? Is our Number three is that our fast food. If you talk about fast food, do you know a burger in Malaysia has a different sodium content than a big a Big Mac in Malaysia has different sodium content than a Big Mac in UK, right? And the reason is because UK has regulated sodium. They have told them to reduce sodium. Now, if you ask, so th- this leads to the question of how much salt we need. We don't need any salt. Mm. We don't need any added salt. We will get some... So that there's this there's this feeling... There's a lot of discussion in literature. I must say some of it by the salt lobby. There, there is a salt lobby, by the way. They are as strong as the tobacco lobby, as strong as the, I don't know, the olive oil lobby, so on and soya lobby, so on and so forth. But there is a salt lobby. Uh, the salt lobby would, would, would counter that we need salt in our diet, mm. right? And they would give uh, they would give an example of the sub-Saharan. Uh, forgot what was the tribe name, but in sub-Saharan Africa, you have this tribe who will travel about half a day to the salt deserts to lick salt because they don't have salt. Okay, so this is by the salt lobby. On on. on on the other side, you have a lot of uh, you have a lot of evidence that we get enough sodium from the foods we consume. You don't need any added salt. Number one, you don't need any added salt. Number two, the salt that we have in our food items can be drastically reduced, and there is very strong evidence that you can reduce ten percent of your salt every one to two years without any change in taste. So when I said that the Big Mac in UK is different, so that's what I meant. So what they did was, at a population level, they decided to reduce the salt in all their food. And they found that people didn't notice. So first year, you reduce by 10%. And I think it was uh, they did a review after three or four years and they reduced it further. And you can reduce your salt consumption every couple of years. And you would find that there's no, no difference in taste. That's one gradual way that we can do at the population level. The benefits are tremendous. The benefit is you will get a change in uh, blood pressure levels at the population level. 
the prevalence of hypertension will go down right now salt that I, I could spend a whole session on salt so yeah but salt has a lot of detrimental effects by itself so I'll keep it with that <laughs> okay thanks a lot for Sanjay so I guess we we are uh, reaching the end of our podcast so as a closer uh, perhaps we'd, we'd just like to know what are your aspirations and vision uh, for how you see nutrition um, in the future so I see us move as, as we move along number one is we have to address food sustainability we have to incorporate more sustainable practices in the production of food and the availability of food. Uh, that there is this feeling that we should go local. We should see what's available locally and we should eat what is available locally, even though there's a seasonal effect to it. Right? Number two, we should decrease process, uh, consumption of processed food. It's convenient, fast, easy, but it's, it's actually not healthy. Right? Uh, that's how I see it. And number three is, as we move along, along the lines of sustainability, plant-based diet has been shown to be better for the planet compared with meat consumption, just because we spend a lot of carbon emission in number one, producing that meat, and number two, in consuming that meat. So the way I see, if you ask me how I see it forward, uh, and our population has been resistant to change, but very interestingly, in the past five years, I've seen a lot of changes in our population. One that, that gives me optimism that maybe in 10, 15 years time, we will go to a diet, an overall general Malaysian diet, which is high, a lot higher in plant base uh, and very little meat being consumed. Mm -hmm. right. Thanks, Prof. Sanjay. So uh, before we end, uh, since most of our audiences here are will be future doctors. Uh, so perhaps you'd, you'd like to offer some last words of advice. With regards to? <laughs> uh, to absolutely... Study anything. hard or sleep more <laughs> or don't smoke or what kind of advice would you want? I think it's a general advice from, from perhaps our uh, discussion today. Bro. From our discussion today? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I think a few key points. Number one is you all are young. There are many, many years ahead. Think about the planet. Right, we have to be seriously thinking about the sustainability of the planet for when you grow old. So I'm already old, right? But you, you or many of you have a good 50, 60 years ahead, and you would want the planet to be healthy when you grow old. Number one, number two, if we talk about health, there's this movement to a hundred year old age, right? That for you, compared to me, you should have an expectation that you will be living to a hundred. Right? Because there are a lot of advances going on right now at many different levels, trying to uh, hack our biology in order for us to live that 100 years as an average. So that's number two. You should be aiming to live to 100. Uh, number three, adopt healthier lifestyle practices. I wouldn't say the best because all of us have our own limitations. If possible, adopt as healthy a lifestyle as you can. Watch your mental health. Be mindful. I think I covered a lot of things so far. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Prof. Sanjay. So that was some wholesome advice uh, and very beneficial for all of us. So once again, I'd like to thank you not only for your time, but for the very beneficial insights that you've, you've provided uh, throughout this whole time. So thank you so much for your time, Prof. Thank you, Joel, for having me. It's always a pleasure to talk to the younger ones and hopefully you've gained something today.